Charlie Carroll is one of the few high-stakes players who plays a purely exploitative style. He's not afraid of calling you down if he thinks you're bluffing, regardless of what the solver might say. But what exactly was his thought process behind the call? Let's take a peek into the mind of an exploitative genius Say no to GTO, kids. and more importantly, talk about how to protect ourselves against exploitative players in general. Let's start off by examining his strategy on the earlier streets. By choosing a small size on the flop and following it up with a big overbet, Charlie is targeting the ace highs in big blinds range that will presumably peel flop and fold turn. I want to make the ace highs call on the flop, and so I'll bet quite quite small with this hand because I know that I want a double barrel and I'm getting value from the ace and the king and the queen highs. Uh, and this because people are very unable to notice the difference between having ace four here and ace eight here. If I bet a quarter on the flop and then overbet the turn, then people are playing a huge proportion of their range exactly the same. And that means that I can be on the level above that and exploit that by just making sure that if I have a bluff, that huge proportion of their range folds. It works especially well in practice because as Charlie says, most players fail to make the distinction between ace4 and ace8. So what ends up happening is that they float all their ace highs on the flop, which leads to them overfolding the turn when faced with a second barrel. So how can we protect ourselves against someone like Charlie who is double barreling all his air. Well, one way would be to actually make the distinction between ace4 and ace8. Unlike stronger ace x which has a bit more showdown value, weak ace x has some pretty good properties for raising. Not only do we fold out some hands that have us completely crushed, we also deny a fair amount of equity against hands like jack9 and 10-8, combos that we conveniently unblock. But most importantly, by raising our weakest ace x and king x at some frequency, we avoid saturating our calling range with high cards, making it much easier to defend versus a turn barrel. Someone who is well versed in GTO should also be able to recognize when his opponent is c betting too much. This is because a big part of GTO is knowing which boards are good or bad for our range. In a blind versus blind situation, Low pad boards are actually not that advantageous for the small blind. As a result, he needs to be very selective with his bluffs. While it's fine to see bet something like jack8 with a club occasionally, overcards without a club are mostly pure checks. So if the small blind were to adopt Charlie's approach of double barreling all his air, it'll soon become obvious that he's over c betting. All it takes is for him to show down a hand like Jack-8 without a club, and a GTO player would catch on to what he's doing. In this case, one possible adjustment would be to shift all of our ace x and king x mixes to pure raises. Raising generates more folds against someone who is c-betting too much air, and while calling also has good EV in theory, it isn't a great option if we expect to get barrel a lot on the turn. The point is that knowing how a spot works in theory can help us identify mistakes in our opponent's strategy, and from there, we can start thinking about how to exploit those mistakes. But what if our opponent uses a bet size that doesn't exist in theory? It might not be technically correct for small blind to overbet the turn, but we still need to have some idea of how to defend against big overbets in practice. And this is where a good understanding of GTO concepts can be very helpful. One of these concepts is indifference, the idea that our opponent is getting certain odds on his bluffs and that these odds change according to his bet size. For example, against a small bet like one third pot, our opponent is getting excellent odds. If we don't defend enough of our range, his bluffs start to become too profitable and he can exploit us by bluffing all the time. On the other hand, Facing a huge bet like 2.5x pot, small blind is getting terrible odds. So if we don't fold the vast majority of our range, he would have absolutely no incentive to bluff us for that size. As scary as overbets might seem, it's actually quite easy to defend against them. This is because the hands that we need to call are often very intuitive. In this specific situation, for example, 
all we need to call are nut flash draws, combo draws, as well as the occasional top pair. That's enough to stop Small Blind from profiting with his bluffs, and we're also folding enough such that we don't lose too much the times we run into a strong hand. If this sounds like a very defensive approach, that's because it is. The whole idea of GTO is based around minimizing losses as opposed to maximizing profit. It's a bit like in boxing, where the best boxers prioritize a good defense. But the moment their opponent takes one step out of line, they are able to switch from defense to attack and immediately punish their mistake. In this case, a GTO player should be able to recognize that an overbet of this size is a serious error. As the big blind, we will typically slow play some percentage of trips on the flop. Something like 5-6 with a club is an excellent candidate to slow play, since we block a lot of the draws that we can get value from, not to mention we do run into stronger trips occasionally. This sets a cap on how big small blind can bet the turn. Use too big of a bet size, and we can fold most of our range, leaving behind a big proportion of trips in our continuing range. This isn't great for small blind, even when he has a strong hand like trips. Weak trips don't want to isolate themselves against strong trips, and strong trips would rather size down and get a bit more value from hands they don't block. Full houses have a different problem of their own. Because they are not vulnerable to big blind straws, we actually lose a bit of value when we bet too big. The math behind this is pretty complicated, so I'm just going to leave you with the main takeaway. If we have a nut hand that is not vulnerable to getting outdrawn, the biggest size that we can use without losing any EV is the geometric one. In this case, Charlie's bet of 2.5x pot is way too big because it leads to an SPR of 1.7 on the river. Instead, 2x pot would be the upper limit of what he can bet since it sets up a 2x pot size jam on the river. And of course, if none of Small Blind's mate hands want to be betting so large, then it goes without saying that he shouldn't be using this size with bluffs either. Which brings us to the question, how can we take advantage of Charlie's mistake? Well, the most direct way would be to slow play even more strong hands on the flop. By increasing the proportion of trips in our calling range, we turn his overbet from a big mistake into a massive one. Whether he's doing it with trips or bluffs, he would be putting in way too much money against a range that is effectively uncapped. It's the equivalent of putting all of your weight on the ice without knowing how firm it is. Even though you'll mostly get away with it, you lose way too much the one time that you run into the nuts. As played, Big Blind decides to call the overbet, and the river pairs the 10. This is a terrible card for the small blind. It devalues his 5x and pocket trees, which were his main value hands on the turn. At the same time, Big Blind is the only player who can have 10x, since Small Blind shouldn't be betting 2.5x pot on the turn with top pair. Charlie correctly checks, the Big Blind goes all in, and Charlie thinks for about 5 seconds before making the call. Even though the call looks absolutely insane, there is actually some method to the madness. If the big blind had a hand like ace or king high, he might figure that his hand is strong enough to check and win at showdown occasionally. This means that when the big blind does bet, the only hand that Charlie loses to is a 10. If we further assume that big blind will always use a smaller size with 10x, then calling with queen 7 actually becomes a no-brainer. Of course, that's a lot of assumptions, and if any one of them turns out to be wrong, the call can go from winning to losing very quickly. It's an inherent problem with exploitative poker, that our play is only as good as our assumptions. For someone like Charlie, who has a natural gift for figuring out how people think, it's an approach that works very well. But if you try to emulate it blindly, you might just find yourself punting off multiple stacks. This hand is actually a good example of that. Charlie himself mentions that most players will jam all their air and bet a smaller size with 10x, presumably because they expect small blind to overfold versus the jam. The 
But what happens when this assumption is wrong? Well, we get destroyed by players like Charlie, who are willing to stick all the money in with Queen High. On the other hand, if we adopt a more balanced approach of jamming with bluffs and value, then it doesn't really matter what our assumptions are. If Charlie wants to call with hands like Queen 7, then our 10x would just make a ton of money. If he wants to overfold, then our 10x would start to lose value, but because our bluffs are now betting the same size as our value, they are able to recoup all the EV that our value hands lose. It's a risk-free way of maximizing our EV because we win the entire pot when we bet, regardless of how our opponent responds. The same principle applies on the turn, where we saw Charlie bluff with a size that doesn't get used by any mate hands. This isn't necessarily a problem in itself if he thinks that Big Blind will overfold against 2.5x pot. But on the off chance that Big Blind is calling too much, Charlie's bluffs would just be losing EV for nothing. Instead, if we choose a sizing that does get used by some mate hands, it doesn't cost us as much even if our assumptions happen to be wrong. If we bluff for a third of the pot for example, it's not the end of the world if our opponent happens to be calling too much. We still have hands like ace-king and pocket sixes that can get a bit more thin value if the big blind is floating the turn with too many hands. And just like before, this guarantees us our rightful share of the pot no matter how our opponent responds.